Well, good morning. I want to begin by saying thank you for the gracious invitation to preach today during Christian Theological Seminary's celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, this is a remarkable institution full of many wise and faithful people, and it truly is an honor to be here with you. I do have to confess, however, that when I first received this invitation, I felt a little aturullado. Uh, aturullado is a lovely folkloric Spanish word that means something like perplexed or bewildered. I mean, I, I understood what the invitation entailed, but in spite of the fact that I identify as Hispanic, I'm not sure what Hispanic heritage actually is. I've often felt the same way when I've been invited to talk about Hispanic or Latinx preaching. I immediately begin thinking of all the different kinds of preaching that might include, and I, I wonder whether I should be thinking about the preaching of Latino deacons during the Spanish language masses in predominantly white Catholic parishes, or, or maybe instead I should be thinking about the sometimes Spanish and sometimes English preaching happening in the growing number of Hispanic Pentecostal megachurches. And, and then, there's the often bilingual preaching that's happening in Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian churches in the Rio Grande Valley as they are communicating the gospel both to those who recently crossed the border and to those whose U.S. citizenship stretches back to when a shifting border crossed their ancestors seven or eight generations ago. Hispanic preaching changes in subtle and not so subtle ways based on particular traditions, denominations, and geography, as well as in response to the countries of origin, the recency of migration, the socioeconomic status, and the kinds of education experienced by both the preachers and the congregations. So maybe, maybe you're starting to get a sense of why I was a little aturullado when I received this kind of invitation. As Nick led off this morning by saying, there's nothing monolithic about Hispanic heritage or preaching or identity. So the only place I can really think to begin is with diversity, which is at the heart of all of the passages that we've heard together this morning. The 11th chapter of Genesis begins by telling us that the whole world had one language and the same words. It was a kind of Edenic Esperanto. And then eight verses later, that single language had become many. And people had scattered all over the face of the earth. And what the book of Genesis describes as the confusion of language wasn't incidental or accidental. It was deliberate. The triune God said, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Most scholars from the earliest rabbis onward have viewed that confusion of human language as a divine judgment to thwart the ambition of a prideful people. But it's not a huge step from that point to look at the kind of diversity that was introduced at Babel as a kind of curse on humanity, a disruption of the unity we think we might otherwise have had, and even perhaps a contributing factor to the misunderstanding and violence that plague us to this day. Now, that point of view doesn't take into account that there was already plenty of disunity, misunderstanding, and violence in the earlier chapters of Genesis, when the world is described as having that 
one language and the same words. But it's still a fairly typical view of diversity. We seem to hear on a daily basis from people who see diversity as a threat to be confronted or contained. But even when diversity is viewed more charitably than that, maybe as a difficulty to be resolved or a challenge to be addressed, the primary lens is still negative. But I think there's another way for us to think about the introduction of diversity, both in this particular text and in the spaces around us. A 19th century Jewish rabbi named Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin argued that the real problem at Babel was the pursuit of absolute uniformity. In his view, the builders of the tower were the world's first social engineers. They were trying to create an empire in which everyone lived in the same place, used the same words, and thought the same thoughts. And in response to their efforts, God introduced diversity, not as a curse, but as a cure. The sudden multiplication of languages preserved human particularity in all of its beauty and nuance. It prevented despotism, and it went hand in glove with the God-given mandate to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth. And it's that kind of diversity introduced at Babel that sets the stage for the miracle of Pentecost. By the second chapter of the book of Acts, Jesus had already promised his followers that they were going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But when the sun rose on the day of Pentecost, the entirety of the global church could still fit in a single house. And from a global perspective, at least, its members all looked and sounded pretty similar. And then the Spirit showed up. And suddenly, this group of people who had all grown up in the same geographic region, who all spoke the same two or three languages, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It probably just sounded like Babel to the people next door. But the God-fearing Jews from across the world who had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost had a different reaction. Luke says that they were bewildered. They were utterly amazed. They were aturullados. They were shocked that a bunch of blue-collar Galileans were suddenly speaking all the language of the world and they looked at one another and they said, what does this mean? And what does it mean? On one hand, it means that the same God who loved the world enough to send Christ into it wanted the gospel message to be accessible for everyone. And so the first miracle of the Spirit in the age of the church was a miracle of translation. But I wonder sometimes why God chose translation. It seems like it would have been just as easy to enable everyone in the crowd that day simply to be able to understand one of those two or three particular languages that the disciples already spoke. And it certainly would have been a lot less chaotic. I mean, think about the way that Pentecost played out. For every one language that you could understand, there were dozens being spoken that you might never have heard before. All of the voices overlapped together in a cacophony of sound. And yet, that's what God chose. A kind of beautiful chaos. And out of the hubbub of all the languages of Babel and then some, some, 
Everyone in the crowd that day heard the gospel in her or his own native tongue. I wonder how particular it got. I wonder if they heard the slang from their own streets back home. I wonder if they heard the figures of speech that their mothers and fathers would have used. And what did that mean? I think it means that God doesn't see diversity as a threat or even as an inconvenience. No, I think that God sees diversity as the gift that God gave. Perhaps it takes all the languages of the world to render the gospel message in all of its fullness, to reflect the glory of God in all of its fullness. Perhaps the chaos of Pentecost was always intended to be the norm, a kind of foretaste of what John the Revelator saw in his vision when he spoke of a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language that would stand before the throne and before the Lamb declaring the glory of God in more languages than we could even name. Perhaps, perhaps, we are most fully and truly the church when what we most have in common is Christ. Not our theological persuasions or our political affiliations or our languages, including our academic jargons, but Christ. Perhaps. But I want to return again to that question from the second chapter of Acts. What does this mean? Ultimately, I think that's the real question for any sermon. What does this mean? What does this musing on diversity mean for the gathered saints of Christian Theological Seminary during Hispanic Heritage Month? As Nick said earlier, when I'm not moonlighting as a chapel preacher, a significant portion of my work involves supporting theological schools as they continue to adapt their educational and financial models to better fulfill their missions. And in the midst of ongoing demographic change, a large number of schools today are focused on how they can better serve new constituencies, at least newer to them, including Hispanic and Latinx students. Administrators in those schools have noticed that God-fearing Christians from every nation under heaven have shown up in their neighborhoods and even in their denominations, and they are huddled together even now trying to determine how best to translate what they have for these new audiences. But I wonder sometimes if that's the right way to think about it. And I think back to an experience I had 10 years ago when I was leading a preaching conference for Methodist pastors in Guatemala. We were meeting at a campground in the hill country near a small town called Chichicastenango. There were about a hundred pastors gathered there, and I was teaching in Spanish, and we were simultaneously translating into Quiche, a Mayan language spoken by some of the indigenous communities still today. And as I looked out across this sea of pastors, I, I noticed that they were from many different generations, but there was one who stood out in particular, who seemed to be well on up into his 80s. So during one of our breaks, I sat down with him and struck up a conversation, and I learned that his name was Martin Morales. And Martin had been pastoring congregations for more than 60 years. During that time, he had actually planted four or five different churches, all of which now had several hundred members each. He would go and live in a community and work as an itinerant farmer and 
establish a church. And about a decade later, when it was on his feet, he would move on and do the whole thing again. Hardly ever drawing a salary from any of these foundling communities of faith. For this conference, I had prepared a a pretty robust workbook for each of the participants so that they could have a summary of what the lessons were and also so that they could write down their own notes and reflections. And I noticed as, as I was talking with Martin that he hadn't written anything in his notebook. And so I asked him, and he told me that he couldn't read or write. And I just stared at him for a moment. And then I asked how he had preached for all these years. And he said that either a close friend or family member would read to him aloud the passage of Scripture he wanted to preach on over and over again until he had memorized it. And then as he was working in the fields, he would think through the sermon he was about to preach until he had that roughly memorized as well. For 60 years. And as I was sitting there, I realized that no matter how carefully I had prepared my materials, no matter how thoughtfully I had tried to contextualize them, that in that particular moment, I had far more to learn than I had to teach. And it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder whether in these moments of encounter and exchange for so many theological schools, What's needed isn't to figure out how best to translate Schleiermacher or Tillich or Bart into Spanish or Sinhala or Swahili. I'm just not sure that the vibrant immigrant congregation springing up all around us would somehow become more vibrant if only their pastors had a better understanding of the documentary hypothesis. Or if they only knew what exactly happened to the Jebusites. And hear me, none of that, none of it is to say that there aren't valuable resources and faithful wisdom that established institutions have to share. But I wonder if the most valuable gifts aren't the ones traveling in the other direction. I wonder what would happen if more of us looked at the growing Hispanic Christian constituencies around us as if they were the ones who had something to give. I wonder how we might change as a result of hearing the testimonies of how they have come to know God as they have passed through the crucible of migration or lived in the margins of their communities. I wonder what we might learn from the vitality of many of their congregations, and from the faithful resilience and entrepreneurial brilliance of many of their pastoral leaders. I wonder what might happen if we learned to listen to these voices that I believe God is sending into each of our ecclesial tribes and cultures. Because the nature of Hispanic diversity means that these voices are Catholic and mainline and evangelical and Pentecostal. They are theologically liberal and theologically conservative, socially liberal and socially conservative. And they often define the borders and carry out the practices of our shared ecclesial and theological and social tribes in different ways than the rest of us, in ways that confuse our categories. And I wonder if that too isn't part of the gift. That in this middle ground between Babel and eternity, as we sometimes struggle to understand one another, as we feel a little aturuyal, I wonder whether diversity isn't just offering us a beautiful opportunity in the midst of misunderstanding and attempts at understanding.
to begin to understand ourselves and to understand God in new ways. Amen.